Okay, my, my name is Monica Yearwood. This is the, uh, the video for Ayurveda and digestion. That's part of the 10 day Ayurvedic detox class that I'm leading both um, at Hamsa Center as well as online. And um, just making sure that this is working right now. Well, I hope that it's working. I think it seems to be working. Okay, thanks Colleen, glad you're here. <laughs> glad you're here to help me through this. Um, okay, so this is the video for the 10 day Ayurvedic cleanse and we're gonna be talking about digestion and Ayurveda. So digestion has a really special place in Ayurvedic medicine. Actually, there are, there are eight branches of um, medicine in Ayurveda, um, psychology, toxology, toxicology, I'm sorry, pediatrics, um, eyes, ears, and throat medicine, um, and uh, rejuvenation therapies, as well as Vashikarana, which is kind of like this aphrodisiac, and then one branch of me medicine, which is called Kaya Chikitsa, and that is the internal medicine. Um, and actually, the word kaya has many different meanings, but in reference to the kaya chikitsa, it refers to agni. So internal medicine is actually about, all about the regulation of agni. And so agni is your, your fire. It's like your metabolic fire. Um, kaya chikitsa is what I, most Ayurvedic practitioners in America um, practice and what we get trained and, and how to how to do. So most of our practices and most of our therapies are all about the regulation of Agni. Um, and again, Agni is kind of like your overall metabolic fire. And um, there are four types. Um, so there's Visham Agni and Visham Agni is like irregular Agni function. Um, so sometimes it's fast or sometimes it's slow, essentially. Um, and so when Agni is high or when fire is high in the body, then you can see quick digestion or loose bowels or loose elimination. And when Agni is low, then you could see slow, slow bowel or sluggish bowel or no elimination. So there's Visham Agni. And then there's Tikshna Agni. And the word Tikshna means sharp, so sharp fire. So when agony is high in the body, and then you can see like a lot of loose bowel or loose elimination um, or fiery type symptoms in the body. And then we have mand agni, and mand means slow. So slow agni, this is like you could see sluggish metabolism or slow bowel movements or um, a constipation as well. And then we have Sam Agni, and the word Sam means balanced. So the person has a balanced Agni function in the body. Mostly, Visham or irregular Agni function gets attributed to Vata. So Vata tends towards um, Visham Agni, but Pitta can also have Visham Agni or irregular Agni function. Um, Tikshna or sharp or high Agni function gets mostly attributed to Pitta type conditions. Mand Agni or slow Agni function mostly gets attributed to Kapha constitutions. Pitta constitutional types tend to have the easiest time realizing or acquiring balanced or Sam Agni um, function, but it's something that all of us strive to acquire. So up until this point when I've been speaking about digestion, I've been mostly referring to what most of us would think about when we say digestion, which is the physical digestion of food and elimination. But digestion actually refers to much more than that from an Ayurvedic perspective. Uh, we actually digest everything that we are consuming through our senses. Uh, so through what we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, taste with our mouth, smell with our tongue, and feel with our skin. All of these uh, inputs are modes of digestion. And so when we say that a person has strong agni or good agni function, it means that we're able to digest essentially whatever it is that we're consuming. 
and effectively extract the nutrient from what it is that we consume and effectively rid ourselves of the waste. So we become toxic when our ability to digest whatever it is that we're consuming becomes compromised uh, for a long period of time and we're not able to do that. So uh, perhaps we're underneath chronic stress or we're in an emotional trying situation. Over time, being in an emotional trying situation for so long, it becomes difficult to process or digest, digest it. Uh, we become overwhelmed. Or perhaps we just have been following a poor diet for so long that our internal digestive fire becomes too depleted and we can't digest it. So a lot of the lifestyle practices Hi, hey. Um, a lot of the lifestyle practices in Ayurvedic medicine work to either restore Agni function or keep it really strong. And um, another thing that's interesting about it too, speaking about the physical digestion of Agni, we want our Agni to be strong uh, so that we can handle all of life's situations, whatever, you know, life kind of throws at us, life becomes challenging at times. And um, so having that really strong Agni can help us to do that. If we have a weak in Agni, um, so if our Agni is disturbed or weak, it also doesn't really matter how high quality of the food that we eat is because we can also manufacture toxins internally if our internal Agni is weak, is in a weakened state. So that's also something I think is really interesting to think about as well. So <clears throat> how do we know what type of Agni function that we have? Um, mostly we can see it, or one really easy way to see it is through our actual bowel eliminations. So the bowel is called a mala, and the word mala means waste, but it also means tissue memory. Um, so we can see how the deeper levels of our physio physiological function via these tissue memories. So the bowel is a tissue memory. There's a saying that's sometimes said in Ayurvedic circles that's don't flush the evidence. Don't flush the evidence. So it's something that you can see and it can help you to understand the deeper functioning of your phys physio physiology, essentially. So if your bowel elimination is irregular, so sometimes you're regular for a while and then sometimes it disappears, um, then that indicates that there's irregular uh, agony function. But then you can also look at the way that you tend to process life's experiences. So perhaps if a person is like sometimes totally on it for a long time and then all of a sudden they kind of lose it or perhaps they're organized for a period of time and then they're totally disorganized or they're starting multiple projects or and they've got all sorts of different things going on that sometimes they're consistent with and then sometimes they're not consistent with. That is also a symptom of irregular Agni function. Sharp Agni function, so when Agni is really high, looking at the bowel again, we can see if a person has a lot of Agni or high heat in the body that the, perhaps there could be loose bowels or um, diarrhea or there could be conditions on the body that indicate high Agni function such as inflammation, acne or rosacea. But then also what is this person's emotional response and way of relating to life? Um, if that person sort of burns through their experiences, almost like there's this very passionate disposition that they have or they're hungry, hungry, hungry for, you know, more learning, more acquiring <clears throat> possessions, material things, it's never enough. There's lots of desire and there may be tendencies toward um, irritability or cr criticism or desire to control. Those are also symptoms that Agni function is very high in the person's mind and in the body. Manda Agni, again, that's the slow digestive type. So looking at the bowel again, a person would feel um, quite frequently that they're not eliminating their, their eliminations entirely, that their digestion just moves slow, that there's a slow transit time from when they actually ate their food to when they eliminated the food. Um, that the bowel movement was incomplete, 
quite often it's formless or you may see mucus or a lot of stickiness in the bowel movement itself. Those are all symptoms of the slow Agni function of the body. And then in the mind, you may see slow processing, you know, difficulty with gathering or understanding new information, uh, procrastination, lots of delays with getting started with things, tendencies to ruminate in the past. Those are all symptoms that that person's overall metabolic Agni, their fire, is running slow or, or is dimmed. Some Agni, balanced elimination. So on a daily basis, the person should be eliminating uh, 6 to 12 inches in length. It should come out with relative ease around the same time in the morning part of the day. There should not be strong cravings for any particular food, well, healthy foods, of course, but not strong cravings for unhealthy foods like sugars, um, carbohydrates, or um, stimulant, stimulants, etc. And then in the mind, the person would have balanced Agni function in the mind, so feeling uh, peaceful, equanimity, inner contentment, balance with one's desires, general approaches to life, etc. <clears throat> So once you understand your Agni type or your Agni tendency, we can start to employ lifestyle practices to balance that Agni function. So again, starting with Visham Agni, the irregular Agni function. There's nothing more balancing to irregularity than regularity. So the best thing that a person can do that has tendencies towards irregularity is establishing regular routines in their lives. And we would say the best place to start would be an irregular meditation practice. So meditating at about the same time every day, ideally in the morning around the time that the sun is rising, uh, would be a good starting practice. So that regularity and routine. The next important practice for somebody with irregular Agni function would be eating at regular times. And it doesn't have to be to the minute, but around the same time every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This just helps to entrain the body that there's regularity in what you're putting in and everything can be, you know, sort of functioning on this routinized regulatory system. It also helps to support healthy circadian rhythm function um, in the body as well. Uh, eating a cooked foods, nourishing diet is also really helpful and favoring the largest meal midday. Well, all constitutional types should really be doing that, but especially people who have a regular digestive function eating the largest meal midday, and then the smallest meal for dinner. So that allows the digestion to rest. And really, one of the most powerful healers for digestion is letting it rest via different fasting methods. So the favoring of the smallest meal at dinner at night actually gives your digestion an op opportunity to rest and to start to heal itself. Then we have... Um, Mm. Another helpful thing too for irregular digestive function is consuming carminative herbs so, or, and spices. So these are spices that have uh, certain qualities to them that dispel gas and also enhance a little bit of heat in, in the digestion, which can help with people that have um, irregular digestive function. So that would be cer certain spices like uh, cumin, cinnamon, cardamom, fennel seeds, etc., and you could pick up a book. I really like the book uh, Yoga of Herbs that has a whole list and description of how these herbs and spices work to enhance digestive function as well as all their other qualities. But that'd be a good place to start. And of course, you know, maybe, you know, picking out maybe five to ten spices to start with and getting them from like a bulk spice store and transferring them to glass jars. You could even like write out their properties and effects on the jar and a label and just keep them on your counter and start to learn about their uh, attributes. One thing that we do in Ayurveda is we make spiced waters and so you could take spices for your Agni type and you just put them in water. So a simple one is ginger root spiced water which tends to be good for all constitutional types. So you just take a few slices of raw ginger and put it at the bottom of a cup and top it with hot water and let it sit for five to 10 minutes and then sip it throughout the day. And you could drink like four cups of that a day to help with regulating your Agni or your digestive function. The ginger one is a very simple one. We also have one that's uh, 
cumin, coriander, and fennel. That's also a good one for all three of the constitutional types. Where you take equal proportions of cumin seeds, fennel seeds, and coriander seeds. So maybe you know a half a teaspoon of each of these. Uh, so then you've got one and a half teaspoons total of spices and top it with four cups of boiling hot water. Let it steep for five to 10 minutes and sip, sip it throughout the day. So we use spices, they're like our digestive enzymes essentially. And different spices have different attributes, but those two uh, spice waters are good generally for all constitutional types. And um, if you want to pick up a book or something like that, you could learn more about the spices that are beneficial for your specific digestive type. <clears throat> so then we have agni, I'm sorry, tikshna agni. So tikshna agni is the agni that's the high one, and that's the sharp one. And we mostly see that with uh, pitta types. And the symptoms are fast, illuminations, desire, passion, acquiring, nothing's good enough, seeing, you know, criticism and things, you know, what's wrong, and, um, and also like diarrhea and inflammation on the skin. So those are all symptoms of sharp or high agony function. So with that person, we really want to cool them. We want to cool them. Uh, when agni is really high, it becomes difficult to fast because fasting or abstaining from food actually increases agni in the body. So that would be one constitutional type that we would be weary or slow to say, let's fast you. Um, they get really, really hungry and irritable. So eating at very regular times, though, is really important. Abstaining from things that generate agni or heat agni, so that would be pungent spices. And pungent spices are the spices that increase the temperature of heat in the mouth. They actually trigger the trigeminal nerve in the face, and they make your brain think that it's hot. So it actually increases the temperature of heat in the mouth. So that's all your peppers, your cayenne, your cayenne peppers, your chilies, your onions, etc. And then um, all fried foods can be very provoking for agni as well. Stimulants, alcohol, those all tend to increase agni or fire. Tomatoes um, also tend to increase agni. And then uh, favoring cooling lifestyle practices and activities, joining non-competitive sports, practicing cooling pranayama or breathing practices. So. Breathing in and out of the left nostril only is very cooling to the body. Um, so breathing in and out of the right nostril helps to increase heat in the body. So, uh, yep, so we just take the thumb, cl close the right nostril, point your middle finger to the forehead, and then you can breathe in and out of the left nostril for about five minutes or so. That will help to de decompress or reduce agni. Another pranayama or breathing practice is shitali pranayama. <clears throat> and with that one, you just stuck, stick your tongue out and curl it. And breathe in and out through um, a curled tongue. Actually, I really like this one. Uh, it's, it's kind of a combination of shitali and alternate nostril breathing pranayama. So you inhale the breath through a curled tongue. And then you close the right nostril and bring your pointer and middle finger to your forehead and exhale out the left nostril. Inhale through a curled tongue. And exhale out the left nostril. And you can do that seven times in a row to help with cooling the mind and the body. The last di digestive type is mand agni. And so mand agni, again, is when your overall agni function is slow. And so the symptoms of slow agni or low uh, agni function are um, sluggishness, slow bowel move, movements, low metabolism, tendency toward weight gain, difficulty losing weight, hard time concentrating, foggy mind, depression, holding on to the past, procrastination, just overall slow, slow metabolic agony function. So with that type, we really want to increase the amount of heat in the body. So, and we want to increase stimulation and activity. 
So some of the dietary practices would be pungent spices. So quite the opposite of the last one that we just talked about. We want to create heat. We want to increase fire. And so one of the most powerful ways to do that is through spices. Um, so all of your peppers, your ginger root, cayenne pepper, chili pepper, those would all help to increase digestive agni. And then um, we want to stimulate them via their daily activities as well. So cardiovascular activity would be a good practice for them to do or speed walking, physical activity, ideally early in the morning around sunrise or just before sunrise. Uh, dry skin brushing would be a really good practice for them. Uh, so dry skin brushing is you can you can pick up a natural dry skin brush from your local grocery store and um, you do light superficial brushes on your skin using the dry skin brush towards the heart. And just like five to seven strokes per area of your body, you start at the ankles and you do long strokes towards your heart. So up your legs and then over your abdomen. And when you do your arms, you lift your hands above your head and do long strokes towards your heart. And so why are you doing this? Ma mainly you're doing it because it's a, it's a way to stimulate the lymphatic fluid in the body. So the lymph fluid is the body's waste. It's essentially the bo body's sewage system. Um, so it collects all the waste from all of our cells and then it brings it to the eliminatory organs where it's then excreted out of the body. So it's excreted through our lungs, through our exhalation, we ex actually exhale waste, through our urination, through our bowel movement. Um, and so the lymph system is actually a circulatory system. It's called the body's secondary circulatory system. It's connected you know, via lymph nodes. You have lymph nodes underneath your neck. They're all throughout your entire body, and that's how the lymphatic fluid moves. But unlike the blood circulation, which relies on the heart, so the heart pumps uh, your blood through your body, the lymphatic fluid doesn't have a pump. So it relies on skeletal movement. So our actual skeletal movement moves the lymphatic fluid and our breath. Our breath is a really big one. So a lot of the primary, the larger lymph glands run down the front of the body. And every time we inhale and exhale, we actually pump, slightly pump the lymph nodes and so help to move the lymphatic fluid. So if you're living you know, a sedentary lifestyle or you're not getting as much physical movement or activity, or if, like a lot of us in our culture and society, as we grow up, many of us tend to breathe very shallowly. Um, if you watch a baby breathe, for example, even just little children, you can, see, you can watch how their whole entire bodies breathe, the full capacity of their lungs. But for many of us, we forget how to breathe like that. And as we become adults and older, we tend to breathe much more shallowly through just the upper part of our lungs. Um, which is actually kind of a symptom of anxiety and nervousness uh, in many times where people will forget to breathe. So the, the yogic breathing practices, specifically ujjayi pranayama, which is like the basic level breathing practice, is the first step actually in practicing yoga, or the physical asanas. And you learn how to breathe deep into your low belly, into your low abdomen. Um, and in doing that, then you expand the full capacity of your lungs and you actually manually, you know, engage in this lymphatic uh, system. So physical activity, deep breathing, uh, yogic breathing practices really help to stimulate the, the lymphatic fluid, the waste. You want that stuff out of you. And so stagnant lymphatic fluid um, I'm kind of taking a sidestep a little bit, but in Ayurvedic medicine, that, that lymph, the health of the whole lymphatic system is extremely important. It's a key indicator in health. And in modern medicine, um, the lymph system has actually been a total mystery. They've, they've not really paid very much atten atten uh, attention to the lymphatic system until just very recently. And so now they're starting to look at how lymphatic health plays into human health. Again, the lymphatic fluid is our waste. It's our waste system. It's our body's sewage system. So if it's not functioning well, then how is that going to affect everything else? So currently we know that stagnant lymph can create sluggishness, fatigue in the mind, slowness. It can lead to different um, low immunity uh, systems. So chronic flu or chronic sickness can be a symptom of stagnant lymph um, 
buildup in the body, fibroids, tumors, all of that can also be a symptom of lymphatic system not working optimally. So dry skin brushing is actually pushing the lymphatic fluid through the body. You're manually moving it. And, and that's something that people do um, that's actually engaged like in hospitals. So there are specialists that will come in and use these specific massage techniques to help with relieving leaving something called lymph edema. So that's where lymph fluid has accumulated around different areas of the body. And that happens a lot of times when people have recovered from different types of cancers and they have to have the lymph nodes removed. Then sometimes lymph fluid will accumulate. And so there are massage practices that you can do to actually stimulate the lymph so that it doesn't accrue in that area of the body. So I'm just trying to substantiate a little bit more and give some examples of how powerful um, and actually real the practice of dry skin brushing is. And so <clears throat> when you do dry skin brushing, you just take the, use the slightest amount of pressure. So just the amount of pressure that it would take to move a coin across the table. It's that light. The lymph fluid is that superficial to your uh, skin. Um, it takes a very, very light amount of pressure to move it. So that would be a really good practice, again, for somebody who has mond agni or slow, um, slow agni function. So again, the, we've got the four types. We've got the pasham agni, and that's the irregular type. We have the tikshana agni, which is the fast or the high type. And then we just talked about mand agni or the slow or low type. And I gave some examples on how to, how to treat each one of those through home lifestyle practices. And then last but certainly not least is the one that we're all striving for, which is the sam agni type. And that's when your agni is balanced in the body. Um, I'm going to leave it open to see if anyone has any questions. <laughs> About anything I said. Okay. All right. So I also talked about how in Ayurvedic medicine we're we are really trying hard to regulate agni function because digestion, from an Ayurvedic perspective, is actually the epicenter of the immune system. And um, all of our dietary augmentations and lifestyle practices recognize that different types of people have different agni or digestive tendencies. And so the dietary modifications work to reduce the negative tendencies and to strengthen the positive ones. And that's why we have dietary individualization. Uh, so in Ayurveda, different people benefit from different types of diets. Uh, looking at a vata type uh, versus a kapha type. Um, a vata type person tends to do really well with sweet taste. So sweet taste is all your carbohydrates, your dairy, your proteins, and your fats. So they really need a lot of that. Your vata types tend to be the ones that are very slight in frame, tend towards under, being underweight, maybe kind of like have a nervous disposition, or at the very least, if they're underneath stress, they tend to react to life in a very anxious uh, sort of a way. And so they need the most grounding, the most unctuous, and the sweet taste really provides them with that, sweet foods. Um, your carbohydrate vegetables, your pumpkin, your squashes, all tend to really reduce vata dosha. Versus the kapha type, or the person who has excess kapha, that, with that type you see slow metabolism, tendency toward gaining weight, difficulty losing weight. And so for them, we would want to reduce the amount of sweet taste out of their diet. Um, we would maybe even just, you know, cut wheat and dairy completely out of their diet um, and reduce the amount of sweet taste. So there's a lot of dietary individualization that haps, happens in Ayurveda in order to strengthen digestive function. <clears throat> um, Ayurveda has taught for thousands of years that all disease, all disease originates from faulty digestion. And so that path of how imbalance originates in digestion and then it, how it actually manifests as disease is called samprapti, samprapti. And so when you come in for a consultation, one of the first things that an Ayurvedic practitioner is looking for is to see, you know, where this person is on the scale of samprapti. Um, 
but at the beginning of imbalance, you'll see some signs that begin to happen in digestion first. Uh, so that may be something as simple as chronic bloating or, um, or constipation. So that would be kind of like an early telltale sign that something's amiss. And we would say that that person could remediate that pretty well through just lifestyle modification or changes of diet. But if it goes left unattended to, if that person ignores the fact that they're now chronically constipated or they have GERD or, or gastro reflux disease or they're feeling nauseous chronically or they have diarrhea chronically or irritable bowel syndrome or all these different uh, digestive woes, if a person continues to disregard or ignore that, then that's when it can start to evolve into different disease types in the body. Uh, the digestive system is, uh, is where 90% of the pathogens enter the body. So that's how we get colds and flus and, and many other illnesses that actually enters into the body via the digestive tract. And it's also where we absorb all the nutrients from the foods that we consume. That's how we utilize the nutrients. So if there are digestive compromises at any point, then we may not be utilizing all the, the nutrients from what it is that we're eating and we may be welcoming in uh, poor, poor creatures, <laughs> pathogenic um, bacteria and flus and viruses into our body, into our system. So there are particular things that we can do on a really regular basis to help with keeping our digestion strong. And so there are four specific, four specific things that I would like to share with you today that are really important. Um, so the first thing is in letting your digestive system rest on a regular basis. So that means abstaining from food um, on, a, on kind of a regular basis. The more that you abstain from food, the more that you let your, your digestion rest and the more that you give it an opportunity to heal. So practices that you can do to help with letting your digestion rest are now being referred to as intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting techniques. But Intermittent fasting has really been part of Ayurvedic lifestyle for some time. So simply by eating your largest meal midday um, and your smallest meal for dinner, that would be one intermittent fasting practice that could be really powerful. So your largest meal is taken midday sometime between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I, I tend to observe in most of my clients and in myself that if I eat my largest meal as close to 2 p.m. as possible. That really just helps me to eat my smallest meal at dinner. And this has been a practice that's been found cross-culturally all over the world. It's really like kind of more of an American thing that's unfortunately been spreading through, through the world to have your largest meal um, as the dinner meal. And so when, when we do that, when we eat a bunch of food at night, we're not able to digest it. We go to sleep with a full stomach. The food just sort of sits there and can putrefy in the body and become toxic. We also interrupt a lot of um, hormonal processes that start to naturally start to occur at night. Like at night, our melatonin, which is our sleep, not only a sleep hormone, most people know it as a sleep hormone, but it's actually the body's most powerful antioxidant is melatonin and it's self-produced within ourself and it's produced when you know light starts to go down and starts to dim it's what makes us have that natural desire to want to go to sleep as well but when we eat a lot of food at night it interrupts melatonin secretion uh, so it slows it down so we're not feeling maybe as tired or we're not going to get as good quality of sleep but we also rob ourselves of that really amazing antioxidant to do our body's repair for when we wake up in the morning. It also spikes up insulin, uh, which also tends to decrease at night. So then we spike up our insulin level, which can affect our cortisol, which is our sort of our stress hormone and make us feel more awake. Uh, there have been many studies now done on lots of different animals who eat the same exact caloric value. They eat the exact same food, the same exact caloric value but then they'll have some of the animals eat it before 2 p.m. and the other ones eat it throughout the day. And the ones that eat it throughout the day tend to be heavier in weight. And the ones that eat it earlier uh, tend to lose weight if they were overweight or at least keep their weight balanced. Uh, so those are a few encouraging words on why it's important to eat the smallest meal at night. The next practice is 
eating really high quality dietary fats. So in, in the form of oil, so uh, olive oil or coconut oil is good. And then also we really love ghee in Ayurveda. So ghee is a type of clarified butter and it has many different antioxidants and it's very anti-inflammatory to the digestive tract. So that would be the second thing. Another important digestive healer is the use of probiotic foods and fermented foods. So for thousands of years all over the world, cultures all over the world, when they needed to preserve their food, they used different fermentation methods because there was no refrigeration. But when people would ferment their foods, they were, they were popularizing, popular, populating it, excuse me, populating it with beneficial bacteria that our digestive tract needs. So in our digestive system, we have four to six pounds of bacteria in our digestive system. And <clears throat> very recently, the bacteria in our gut has gotten all this attention because it has all these different roles in our immune system and in our health. So many so that the bacteria in our gut is now being referred to as the forgotten organ. So there have been different studies that um, maybe they've like removed a certain probiotic or I'm sorry, bacteria string from like a gnat or a mouse and it totally changes their behavior. Um, they pick different mating, they pick different mates, they, um, they gain, some of them like gain weight and can't lose it when they change the probiotic strain, but they're eating the exact same food, which is leading a lot of researchers to believe that for some people, obesity may be because of deficiencies and different bacteria strains in our gut. Uh, because actually in a lot of our modern cultures and modern societies, we have different um, bacteria strains, bacteria uh, populations in our gut compared to a lot of indigenous cultures or cultures from different parts of the world. Um, so, and why that's happened is because of over antibiotic use in our, in our medicines and on our livestock. Um, those are a few, a few of the contributions. And also the um, lack of eating of these probiotic rich foods. Uh, because we actually get our first inoculation of bacteria in our gut when we're coming out of our mother's birth canal. Um, so we actually swallow microbes from the vaginal canal and those microbes go on to form the seedlings of our, of our digestive bacteria. So if we inherit a compromised bacterial system from our mother or if we're born C-section, C-section babies have very different uh, flora, gut, gut flora, than babies that are born vaginally. Um, then you know, we can inherit a sort of a weakened system. And then if we're not eating uh, enough probiotic rich foods, and then if we're using antibiotics, which antibiotics wipe everything out of the gut, then we're just contributing to a weakened digestive system. So the gut bacteria we know for sure plays a lot of important roles in inflammation in our body, immunity in our body, di uh, dietary allergies, um, cognitive, the way that we are, uh, you know, our cognitive function, different psychosomatic, um, or I'm sorry, psychological imbalances as well. So like depression, anxiety, et cetera. There's a lot of comorbid association with the, the gut bacteria the, in our actual guts. Um, so <clears throat> with the invention of pasteurization methods, we stopped eating those probiotic rich foods. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why today there are all these compromised digestive issues and how that all came to be through the diminished use of eating fermented foods through uh, the overuse of antibiotics on our livestock and in our medicines um, and then just inheriting kind of a weakened system from our mother and then passing that weakened state on to our own children um, so there's been a lot of um, a lot of different reasons for that so now we have like probiotic supplements that we can use and those are helpful, but um, for reasons not totally understood, taking a probiotic capsule, the bacteria behaves very differently in our digestive tract. So it tends to be transient. So meaning that you take the pill and those, the good guys kind of move through your gut relatively quickly. 
where if you eat fermented foods, the bacteria from the fermented foods tend to hang out, to, tend to repopulate, and tend to commingle with the bacteria that's already there. Um, interestingly enough, probiotic bacteria tends to repopulate slowly and diminish quickly. So it's like you have to continuously be eating it uh, for, it to, for you to maintain it. And then, um, and so when, as you maintain it regularly through eating healthy, you know, pro probiotic food stuffs as much as possible, at least daily, um, then you can really support your immune system function. Okay, so we've said three so far. We talked about um, fat, dietary fats, probiotics, and intermittent fasting. And um, another good gut healer is um, mucilage herbs, I think, are really good. Mucilage herbs. So if you listen to the word mucilage, you can hear the word mucus. So these are herbs that help to restore mucus in the digestive tract and, and throughout the entire body. So the actual digestive tract is lined with a thick mucosa, and the mucosa protects the actual GI tract. Um, when there's chronic inflammation in the body, the mucosa can start to de degrade. So then you start to see inflammation along different areas of the digestive tract, and as the inflammation continues to grow, then it starts to impact the epithelial tissue cells. So lined on the GI tract, there's a system of tightly, tightly jointed cells. They're like this. They should be like this. But if there's chronic inflammation, um, they start to break apart and start to widen. Um, and then they start to allow undigested food proteins and everything that should stay out of the GI tract. Um, it starts to allow it to come into the bloodstream. With that happening, that's when you start to see different dietary intolerances, which you're hearing about all the time. Like you hear about people who have gluten intolerance or dairy intolerance and they can't eat those foods anymore. Um, it's because of this. You know, it's because of the breakdown along the, the digestive tract. And, you know, the primary contributors to that are, you know, eating a poor diet, so an unhealthy diet, not eating enough good bacteria, um, and chronic stress. Nothing, does, nothing promotes inflammation in the body like chronic stress, um, which is unfortunately a lot of, something that a lot of people endure now. So mucilage herbs um, help to rebuild and protect the mucosa along the intestinal tract. So there are um, a lot of these herbs are very easy to obtain, and I'm not like trying to give out a dose or anything like that. I'm encouraging to use these things as dietary staples. So like just like the dietary fats, just making sure that you're eating those on a daily basis um, regularly as part of your diet. And the, um, the probiotic fermented rich foods. Again, there's not like a dose. It's just making sure that it's you know, part of your dietary staple in your daily life. And the same thing with these mucilage herbs. So some, some of these that are just really easy to obtain in your grocery store are things like licorice root, marshmallow root, and slippery elm. I think those are the three that I would start with. And um, if you were just to go to the grocery store and get some tea, like Yogi Tea is a brand of, um, is a brand of tea, and they have like a lot of the teas that <clears throat> are made to help when you're sick, like that you, like throat coat would be one, or um, teas that are, you know, promoted to help with relieving mucus from your lungs and your chest, those are made mostly with mucilage herbs. So if you wanted to start simply, you could just go to the grocery store and pick up a couple boxes of those and just have a couple, tea, couple cups of this tea in the evening as just part of your routine or perhaps in the morning. If you want to take it a step further, you could explore something like mountain rose herbs and you could get some of these herbs in uh, bulk and then you could combine it with spices to enhance the, the properties of the tea itself. So if you got, for example, licorice tea, which I love licorice tea, and you could combine it with cinnamon or ginger or cardamom and, um, and make your own little tea and make your own little healing brew. So um, we've shared a lot today. I told you about how there are eight branches in Ayurvedic medicine, and one of the branches is called Kaya Chikitsa, 
and that refers to all of our internal medicine practices. It's what most of the Ayurvedic practitioners practice in the United States. Um, the other branches are um, psychology, toxicology, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, psychology, um, there's a rejuvenation, there's aphrodisiac, etc. cetera. Um, but we in the United States tend to practice kaya chikitsa, which is the regulation of agni. So the, the whole regulation of our digestive system, essentially. I told you about how there are four digestive types. There's visham agni, tikshna agni, mand agni, and sam agni. And Visham Agni is the irregular digestive type. So when a person's Agni function goes up and down and is irregular, and we can see that via their bowel movements being irregular, but also their behavior and approaches to life may be very irregular as well. There's Tikshna Agni. So where Agni is very high, and um, so you'd see that in the bowel movement through quick digestion, loose bowel movements, but also you could see it in the mind via their approach to life and activities may be full of passion, desire, dissatisfaction, acquiring are all symptoms of high Agni function. And then we have Mand Agni, which is again the low and slow Agni function, which, you, which through the bowel you see slow bowel movements, slow metabolism, sluggishness. In the mind you may see procrastination, clinging to the past, a difficulty concentrating, foggy mind. That's all symptoms of a slow Agni function. And then, of course, we have the one that we all aspire to be, which is Sam Agni. So when Agni is balanced in the body and symptoms through the bowel movement, uh, bowel is, you know, a daily bowel elimination at least uh, 6 to 12 inches in length, comes out with relative ease and at about the same time every day, ideally in the morning. In the mind, Sam Agni, a person feels very balanced has a lot of equanimity, inner contentment. They're not driven by unhealthy craving um, and you know, an overall peaceful disposition. I gave you methods on how to address each of those Agni functions through our diet and our lifestyle behavior. And then we also went over four different digestive healers that everybody should be eating on a daily basis. So thank you so much for your time today. This video again is part of the 10 day Ayurvedic detox and the next live video will be on Monday at 10 a.m. So I hope to see you there and thank you so much for your time today.